Okay, so today we will uh, solve the two exercises and then we will start another <coughs> topic. So um, remember that yesterday we had the convex set and the point outside. Huh? And uh, we, we proved that in Hilbert uh, there is just only one uh, point of minimal distance. Okay, now this is the convex set. Could be half, half space, could be a convex set, whatever. But the important fact is that it is convex. Now what happens if your, your, your C is instead <coughs> a, play, um, a subspace? I remember that yesterday we, we found the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, using unilateral variation. Namely, we compare, given any direction uh, from the inside, we compare this length with all possible lengths along this direction. And convexity means that since you, you are just only from one side, you can do variation only from one side. Hmm? You can compare the length with this only with objects from one side. And therefore, you get just only one inequality. You cannot get an equality. Now, on the other hand, now assume that you have now a, a subspace. And then, then there is really equality. So the exercise was let H be Hilbert and uh, C, a closed subspace. <coughs> then, so this is the point, point H. Uh, in the Euclidean uh, world, this would be what we called X, the unique point X, that maybe sometimes it is denoted by P, C, H. So we have a map sending H into X projection, uniquely defined. Huh? So we have a map sending uh, this into this. So a map sending H into C. Uh, and this, this x is sometimes denoted by projection of h on c, okay? Orthogonal, say orthogonal projection, okay? By orthogonal in the sense of the scalar product that you see from your unit ball. Hmm? So this, this is projection on the closed convex set c of the vector h, okay? Now, uh, yesterday we, we found uh, um, a set of inequalities, but now we have uh, that this must be equal to zero for any C in C. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, so, so H minus X comma any element of, uh, of, uh, of C. And we understand from the picture that there should be orthogonality, right? This orthogonal to this. This is simply the meaning, OK? OK, in the proof. So maybe this is a theorem. No, corollary, maybe. Corol So yesterday we, we proved that H minus X, C minus X, is always less than or equal than zero uh, for any C in C. Why is this so? Well, because capital C is, in particular, closed and complex. OK? So we can apply our Euler-Lagrange inequality. 
it is clear, by the way, that any subspace is convex, right? Okay. So we can apply, so this says that H minus X C is less than or equal than something which is independent of C on the right hand side. So when I write a comma and then here I mean for any C, C just, just a way not to write the quantifier, okay? <clears throat> okay, now we have, so this is, G, this is just from convexity, but we can switch now the, the, the sign of C so that we can use the fact that capital C is a subspace. So if capital C is a subspace, then we, we also have what we didn't have yesterday. So we can change the, it is not, huh? So if this is a point, then also minus it, it is. is. Uh, if, if, if this is the origin, say, then, and then I have a point C, then also minus C is on the set. Hmm? Therefore, we also have here with minus C. And therefore, this must be also larger than or equal to, not only less than. If I put minus C here, I put the minus outside. Uh, and so, I mean, taking simply a variation of this sort, this implies that you have equality necessary equal to zero. Hmm? Namely, essentially, you can, instead of uh, taking C, I mean, equal to zero. So instead of taking C, you can multiply, say, by any number TC with T in R. So if you use these new competitors, then you end easily end up with the equality. Okay, so this is um, the first, but the most interesting exercise of yesterday was, <coughs> was the projection on polynomials. So the projection of polynomials uh, was the following. So the, the other homework exercise. Uh, ah, maybe we can complete also. So the map here, PC, is linear, is linear. Maybe this also check at home that this map, this projection map is linear. Okay, for the subspace C. Okay. Now, projection on polynomials, so we had uh, T cube minus the projection uh, of, uh, so C is the space of, uh, a subspace of all polynomials of degree two. Hmm? Remember? Huh? So, now I take the unique projection on this on polynomial of degree two. And so this, so let me call this, um, this difference uh, T, uh, uh, maybe tau of T. And so, uh, we, have, we know that uh, tau must be orthogonal to any polynomial of degree 2. And this is, what does it mean? This, uh, in the setting of the exercise, means that the integral on 0, 1 of tau t, c t, d t. Okay, is this notation clear? This is the scalar product between an element of L2 and another element of L2. And this is the scalar product integral, okay? So the projection the projected point, tau t, is orthogonal to um, ct, okay? So, 
So uh, what we know is the following. So we have to find uh, this. And what we know is the following, is that uh, so the integral from 0 to 1 to tau t multiplied by alpha t squared. So for any alpha, beta, and gamma, this must be equal to 0. Okay. Okay. So and so now uh, well, from this you find the system, but maybe maybe uh, we, it is not the case to make all computations. So from this, uh, you find the system taking say alpha equal beta equal zero and then gamma equal one or alpha equal gamma equal 0 and beta equal 1, oppure this equal 1 and the other equal to 0. <coughs> this gives um, system. Uh, the system, I write it to you, is the following. Okay. So I don't, I don't do the, it here, just write the solution, but maybe plus equal to 3. This is obtained with alpha equal beta equal 0 and gamma equal 1. Then the other equation is 15 alpha plus 20 beta plus 30 gamma equal 11, 12 with now beta equal gamma equal 0 and alpha equal 1. And the other one, no, sorry, this, no, this is uh, alpha equal gamma and this is beta equal 1. And then beta equal gamma equal 0 and alpha equal 1 gives uh, uh, then this is the system that one obtains. Well, apparently, it turns out that uh, P C T cube is equal to, I hope that this, this is correct, My, no, sorry, minus 4, 5 T plus 1 over 20. Uh, but you don't agree with this 4, right? Yes. Maybe it is 3. 3? Is 3? Well, OK. 3. OK. Fine. Okay, so now the main point of today is to prove, or at least to start to prove, the Ritz representation theorem. The Ritz representation theorem, <clears throat> I don't now. I just comment on it, then we slowly go into the, 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 the. So what is the meaning of the Ritz representation theorem? So first of all, we give a definition. So let me denote by, so H is Hilbert, let me denote by this the set of all L from H into R, say L linear, uh, and, con and uh, continuous. So this is a set <coughs> 
of, of functionals. So it is a functional, it's a linear, <coughs> sorry, linear continuous functional on the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, given any L, so maybe, maybe a remark, so remark, a proposition, say. So proposition, the following are equivalent. Assertions are equivalent. L so let, let so let maybe let L from H to R be continuous, be linear. Then the following assertions are equivalent. L is continuous at zero. L is say continuous L is uh, bounded now I will define it and L is continuous at any point L is continuous at some point at some point h. So given a linear operator, the, uh, the, the following facts are equivalent. L is continuous and L is bounded, essentially. And continuity can be checked just only at one point, or at some point, for instance, at the origin, which is easier as, as usual. Now, what does it mean that L is bounded? So definition, L is bounded. L linear is bounded if <clears throat> there exists a constant positive such that L of H less than or equal H for any H and H. Okay? So why the word bounded? Well, bounded because it, it means that if I take a ball, huh, L of a ball is bounded. Okay, this is clear, right? It takes bounded sets into bounded sets. So it takes bounded sets of your Hilbert space into bounded sets of your image space as the target space, which is just, for the moment, just the reals. Okay, is it clear the meaning of bounded? Huh? I mean, if you take a, a, something which is bounded, then it is contained in a ball. Therefore, this is less than, than some capital R. And therefore, this in absolute value is less than C times R, so it is inside some big interval. Hmm? Is, it, is it clear? Okay, so this means bounded. So the, the proposition says, that once you have a linear map, it is equivalent to check continuity or boundedness. It's, it's equivalent. And uh, um, you, can, you can check just only continuity at zero. Uh, so maybe home you could uh, uh, prove. So here we prove that, uh, here we prove that one Here we prove this, okay? Then some arrows are immediate. So I mean, it is clear that two implies one. 
that 2 implies 4, etc. So it is enough that you show, say, for instance, that 1 implies 2 at home. OK? But you just use the linear structure of your vector spaces. So let us prove that 1 and 3 are equivalent. OK? So assume that L is continuous at 0. Hmm? So now, if this is true, this means that uh, L of H is equivalent to, say, linear map from your Hilbert space with the scalar values bounded here is equivalent, OK? So you can, if you want, if you prefer, this can be replaced once I have proven uh, that arrows. This can be replaced to uh, bounded. Hmm? Is equivalent. So now let, let us prove this. So assume that L is continuous at 0. So then. So if you take, uh, so there exists let me call it uh, there exists delta. There exists a positive delta such that if you take uh, <coughs> the counter image, say, of uh, the unit interval, uh, a name for the R, maybe. Then, by continuity, we know that this is open, so it's contained in some ball uh, of radius delta. Huh? Center at zero. Hmm? <coughs> Contains center at zero. Hmm? Because this is an open set, therefore the map takes open set into open set, and therefore uh, we can find some delta. I mean, this is open in R. If by assumption L is continuous, assumption one, eh? I am proving this. Okay. If L is continuous, then uh, this is open. Counter in the pre image of an open set is an open set, and therefore it contains some ball. Okay, centered at the object. What does it mean? This what means that if I take any <coughs> h in h with h norm of h less than delta, then we have that uh, h belongs to this pre image. Uh, OK, so this means that L of H belongs to this. Uh, and therefore, the absolute value of L of H is less than 1. Hmm? So what I've shown is that, that there exists delta such that if this is less than delta, then L of H. So let me, let me rewrite it here. So I've shown that uh, uh, there exists delta such that H less than delta 
implies L of H less than 1. And actually, this is enough because of the homogeneity of the fact that L is linear. So I would like to prove, uh, you see, uh, I would like to prove this uh, uh, without any restriction. So now take any H. Huh? Take now any H in H. And so we have an inequality just only for those H uh, satisfying this. But this does not. And now I force it to satisfy it by dividing by the norm and multiplying by delta. So now I, uh, so maybe I change, uh, I change letter, take, take uh, uh, H like this, okay? So now define this as H. So assume that this is non-zero. So divided by its norm, multiplied by delta. OK? In this way, we are almost in a position to apply this implication, but not quite, because this is equal to delta and not less than delta. So I cannot really apply this implication to this choice of H. Right? If I would have less than or equal, then I could. But I have the strict inequality for the moment. So just now, um, it is also clear that I can suppose that this is non zero, right? Because if it is zero, I am already here. Now, it is sufficient now to take small epsilon and not. Less than delta. Well, not not is not so. Uh, the problem is not so serious because I can take uh, now a small epsilon positive and define instead the new H, which is delta H script H divided by script H plus epsilon. In this way, surely now we have that this, um, this now is less than delta. Hmm? OK? Hence, I can put this h here. And therefore, I know that this is less than 1. OK? So L of H is less than 1. But L of H is uh, but L of H is what? So L of delta script H divided by script H plus epsilon, and I know that this must be less than 1. Now I use the, the homogeneity, I mean the fact that L, capital L is a 1 homogeneous, so that this is what? This, is, this object here actually is equal to what? It is Delta is positive. Uh, 1 over script H plus epsilon. L of H less than 1. OK? By linearity. Hmm? This says that L of H is less than uh, H plus epsilon divided by delta. Now, 
this is true for any uh, epsilon and therefore we deduce that L of H is less than or equal than H over delta and therefore uh, the constant C that we require is just 1 over delta okay so the constant C exists and it is equal to 1 over delta uh, this is true for any H. Eh? Hmm? Do you agree? And C is 1 over delta. Okay. So we have shown that 1 implies 3. Namely, continuity implies boundedness. Now, we show this is that boundedness implies continuity. So we know that there exists a constant. So fix epsilon positive. Then and take, say, delta equal to epsilon over C. Then if H is less than delta it follows that L of H is less than epsilon okay because we have less than or equal than C times epsilon over C where's C Um, okay. Yes, yes, it is true, it is Lipschitz. Namely, L of H1 minus H2, um, it is less than or equal, which, which is the Lipschitz continuity of, of L for linear maps. Okay. So uh, please at home uh, uh, fix the missing points in the proof, okay, the, of the corol of the um, of the proposition. Okay. Okay. Now, so uh, there is this in interesting characterization. Once you have linearity, then continuity is equivalent to taking bounded sets into bounded sets. This is very convenient. And now, so uh, we have to study a little bit the, the linear continuous maps, uh, functionals maybe. Uh, just one comment here. Uh, if L is bounded, we know that uh, there exists, by definition, a finite number such that that is true. So uh, this means essentially that uh, L of H divided by H, once H is non-zero, is less than or equal to uh, H non-zero. OK. Now, it is clear that what is, which is the interesting constant here? Well, the, is, the interesting constant is the smallest C for which this is true. Because, of course, if it is true for C equal 100, then it is true for equal C equal 200, and so on. So what it is interesting to find the smallest C for which this is true, the Lipschitz constant, OK? So uh, it is interesting to con consider 
the smallest positive number such that L of H is less than or equal CH for any H. H. Well, this is uh, uh, denoted by this symbol here. Hmm? Is this symbol. So at home, you should try to show the following. So this is called the, the norm of L. This is called the norm of L. So we have that um, So you could try to prove one of these equivalent way of defining the norm of a linear functional. Okay? It is up to you what, what you prefer, what you understand better. Any of these, uh, uh, these uh, expressions give you the, the, the length of the linear functional, the, the norm of the linear function. Okay? Now this is a norm. You can check it is a norm. Okay, and it is a norm. And the space of I mean this is a norm. And actually, L of H is a linear space. Is a vector space. Uh, and this is a norm on that vector space. Hmm? And this is a norm. Now, let me just remember what we know in finite dimension, because now, again, because of the infinite dimension, the notion of dual space is really something non-trivial. Let, let me remember, recall you just only what it is known. just only what it is known in finite dimension. OK, if now I have not defined what is the dimension of a Hilbert space. But I can write without ambiguity this. This simply means that you have a finite dimensional vector space with the Riemannian norm, with the, with the Hilbert norm, OK, with the scalar product, with an inner product. So what it is known about LH, well, LA, LH is just, what is LH? So capital H is just a copy of Rn for some n endowed with the scalar product of Riemannian type, right? <coughs> so what is H here? H is just some R, is isomorphic to some Rn on which we put an ellipsoid, a fixed ellipsoid. Hmm? So we have a special, very easy example of Riemannian flat, Riemannian manifold. The ellipsoid does not change with the point. So it is very special Riemannian, because the scalar product does not move with the tangent space. It's just always the same. You have always the same ellipsoid on the tangent space. So very special, easy Riemannian. Huh? So together with an inner product, or equivalently an ellipsoid, the unit ball of the norm. Okay, so this is a way you can think about a Riemannian manifold if you want. But maybe you, you surely already know what is a Riemannian manifold, at least in the embedded case, 
Well, you have a surface. On a surface, you have your tangent spaces. Since it is embedded, your tangent spaces, you can see them, <laughs> are inside the space. And then, on each tangent space, you have an ellipsoid. And the ellipsoid change if you change the tangent space. Because the ellipsoid is the scalar product. And the scalar product may depend on the point. In this case, it does not depend. Just one fixed ellipsoid. Is it clear, the connection? So, I mean, you are working just one uh, chart. <laughs> just one chart. This is geometry in one chart. <laughs> without, without any, I mean, just one ellipsoid. OK, so what is this? This we know. What is this? Is it a vector space? Yes. Which is the dimension? N. So this is isomorphic to are n, and therefore these two are isomorphic. Mm -hmm. They can be identified. So once you have a um, finite dimension, uh, by the way, of course, uh, L of H, you don't even need to write uh, continuous or bounded, because any linear map is automatically continuous in finite dimension. So, any linear, so this is just the space of linear maps. Automatically, they are continuous. All bounded is equivalent. Okay. Uh, and also, this is isomorphic to the to H itself. And therefore, if I do it twice, L of L of H, again, I find something which is isomorphic to H. Is it clear? This is the picture. So you don't need to uh, require continuity. This is automatic. And this is nothing else, another copy of Rn. Huh? The norm is not the same. Huh? If you are starting, uh, if you are starting from okay, if you start from around the sphere, a Euclidean exactly, then that is exactly the Euclidean. But uh, if you start from an ellipsoid, then this is the norm here is not the same ellipsoid. Huh? It's just modification. But anyway, still. Huh? We can also write the basis. If you have a basis here, then we also write explicitly another basis here. No? You know, this is the analogy that we have uh, uh, between, uh, if you want, uh, vectors and covectors. Also, in differential geometry. Okay? One vector and one covector is just the same. Hmm? Okay, so. In finite dimension, so uh, at the end, uh, when we perform this operation of taking linear continuous functions, we don't find any new space. We, we always have the same copy of the same n-dimensional vector space. Well, the point is that in infinite dimension, this is not true anymore, unfortunately. And this probably you already know. I don't know if you know. But uh, standard examples are not in Hilbert setting, but uh, in Banach setting. It is well known that if you start from a Banach space, infinite dimensional, then you take the dual, then you take the dual of the dual, and you don't come back to, to, to your initial space. Unfortunately, L1, L infinity, dual of L infinity is not L1. Eh? We will come slowly to this point, just to let you know that now we are just generalizing the notion of dual space, sometimes denoted also by, uh, well, maybe I'm not, uh, sometimes this, but also sometimes also this. Now I don't exactly remember, the, I don't know exactly. I don't know, I don't remember. The book of Brezis maybe is H star. OK, H star. OK, we can adopt maybe H star if you want. But maybe also H1 is, H prime is also very, very common as a notation. Eh? So remember that this is all. Uh, why this distinction? Well, because in principle, this is called the topological dual. Topological dual meaning linear, continuous functions. 
But if you just require linear functions, then you have another notion of dual, much larger, which is called algebraic dual. Hmm? And that could be denoted with another symbol. So uh, anyway, we, don't, we, are, we never consider algebraic dual here. We are interested in topological dual. So we require continuity. OK? Hmm? OK, uh, now now there is theory. So now, now remark. Examples of uh, it is interesting to remark that there are in infinite dimensions linear discontinuous map. maps. There are. It's not true that any linear map is continuous. Okay? We will see examples, but um, let us see first examples of linear continuous map. So take, fix once for all an element, non-zero element of your Hilbert. And then you can consider the following map. For any H. Okay. Check at home that this is <coughs> okay. This is very easy, by the way. And the Ritz theorem is concerned with the converse statement. The interesting uh, point of the Ritz theorem that now I will try to explain is exactly the converse. It says that all linear maps are of that form. This is much more surprising. Theorem, now I state the theorem. So, so the example says, this is a, these are all linear maps. For any H naught, this is a linear map. Linear continuous map. Hmm? So it's an element of the topological dual. Hmm? Now, theorem. So let, let H be a Hilbert space. And let L be linear continuous functional on H. Then there exists a unique let me denote it by H naught such that L of H. Moreover, this is called the Ritz theorem. <coughs> so it says exactly the converse statement. This, this statement says that these LH0 are bounded linear functions. This says the opposite. Take any bounded linear function, then it is of the form, it is of the form L of H0 for some H0, actually for just one H0. This is much more, huh? much more unclear in some sense, <laughs> right? This is the content of the Ritz theorem. So the consequence of this, one consequence of this. 
So one consequence of this is that we can we have a map. From this, we, we can find a map taking L into H0. Hmm? So it takes any point in, uh, in the dual uh, and associate uh, in uni uniquely another point in the Hilbert space. Not only this, so let, okay, not only this, but this is linear, this, uh, this map taking this into this is linear, huh? and also it, it, this is an isometry because it preserves the, the norm. If this has some norm in the source, then the, the, the image has the same norm. So it's a, the isometry between two metric, it's, it's an isometry between two metric spaces. One like H star and the other is H. Okay? So this is a consequence of this. Now, so now, uh, now let me let me make some comment in finite dimension. A picture of what does what does this mean in finite dimension? At least we try to see what does this mean. Finite dimension. Again, this is well defined. Eh? So what is a linear functional, a non-zero, say non-trivial, linear function on a ren? How can I identify it? I co how can I think about a linear function? OK, this is some, what, what do you think? Well, when I tell you, OK, this is a linear function from a ren to r, what do you think? Well, there are. Yeah, you identified with one vector. So one, one thing would be, OK, uh, and L, so L from H to R is just linear, in particular continuous. Huh? Well, if I know the kernel of L, uh, so this is a linear map from R2 into R, OK? So if I know what it is, so it is the graph is just a plane, right? It's a plane because it is linear, OK? Huh? Is it OK? So now, if I know the kernel, I don't really know exactly the linear map, but almost, in some sense. Huh? Because it's, if I know the kernel, so the kernel is, is, the, is a subspace of, uh, of H, say, co of codimension 1. Hmm? So I have in the source space in Rn, I have a subspace of codimension one. Say for instance a hyperplane. This does not identify L, but almost. I mean, uh, it is enough to know the value of L just outside in one point outside. Huh? So because uh, it is clear that the same kernel can be shared by many linear functions. Right? But once I know the value away at one point outside, since this is co-dimension one, I know this is dimension one, the outside, and I know L everything, everywhere. Hmm? So, um, So this is my, uh, the graph of my linear map. I, I, know, I know the kernel and I know the value in one point. 
and then I know the whole, the whole linear map. So if you want, now let, let me, uh, so this is the graph. Now assume now I, I, I am in a, this is now I am in H, and this is the kernel. This is H. This is the origin. And now I have uh, also the unit ball. Hmm? Some strange unit ball. This is the unit ball of, of H, of the, the Hilbert space. Then what I can do is to consider the translation to this. The picture is not perfect. Let me do it in another way. So this is my kernel. This is my kernel, this is my unit ball. Then what can I do? What I can do is this. Now that I have an infinite dimension, I have just one intersection here. This is the origin. So this is uh, the kernel just translated. So this is the unit ball. This is the kernel just translated uh, of the proper quantity. And then, I mean, <clears throat> what I can do is to identify, to, to up, um, to associate with this kernel, uh, and then there is the, po the problem of normalization, this point here. You see? To this uh, linear subspace, hyperplane, I have the unit ball, and then I can associate this. Uh, point here. This is close to the to, to H naught. This is all essentially so given uh, your L this is up to a constant factor essentially it is your so the the, the, the this is this this H, this point here is of course a point of of, uh, of H. So what I'm saying is that I'm associating to this uh, to this uh, vector subspace, the kernel of L, I am associating this vector. Essentially, it is somehow, in the Euclidean case, it is clear that they are orthogonal, right? Yes, essentially. Just? Yeah, now, now I have to say, indeed, one point is to say how long is this H naught? But geometrically, I think that the, the, the one of the idea is that uh, you, you fix a hyperplane and then you can associate to this hyperplane the intersection of a parallel of it or minus, yeah, minus it also uh, with the, the, the boundary of the unit ball with that, uh, with that parallel translation. And this unique intersection essentially is your H naught. So this is a way maybe to associate uh, to a half, to a um, one codimensional space, subspace, a vector like this. Of course, this is, I mean, there are various things to understand. One, we are in infinite dimension. So it is not clear what is the, the boundary of the unit ball. We don't know. We have never defined the tangent space to the boundary of the unit ball. Very difficult. We cannot. Uh, not only that, but uh, well, again, I think that it is true that in infinite dimension uh, the kernel is one codimensional, so infinite, infinity minus one. <laughs> uh, so, but let, let us go into the proof of the the Ritz representation.
So, uh, we, we define m to be the kernel of n. This is a definition. Okay. So, proof define the kernel of n. Then, there are two cases. Well, if m is, is h, if it covers all your Hilbert space, then L is identically zero. Everything is in the kernel. So L is identically zero. Huh? And therefore, we can simply take H naught equals zero, and it satisfies all assumptions. Hmm? Because uh, this is zero, this is zero, zero equals zero is okay. And U is the unique object that do, does this, okay? So we can assume that uh, M is properly contained in H, okay? Hence, we can take a point outside, okay? Let, let me denote it uh, by uh, take a point outside, G0. Hmm? So G0 is outside of M. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Now, now I will use it, eh, because I take the projection. Uh, so, yes. So maybe I remark it here is enough. OK, remark. <coughs> now we will use that M must be closed. Why? OK, M is, is a closed subspace. H. Well, it is a subspace because it is a kernel. It is closed because L is, by assumption, is uh, continuous. Okay? So the kernel M is the counter image of a closed point. Therefore, it is closed. Huh? L continuous, therefore M is closed. Okay? And this is exactly here the point where I use it because now I have a point outside, I can project it uniquely on, uh, on M. And let me denote it by PM. So I have a unique projection. So take so this is PM G naught. So this point here is uniquely defined by what we have seen at the beginning of the lecture because this is a closed linear subspace. Therefore, we can consider, and actually also we know that, uh, of course, P M G naught is different from G naught because G naught is outside the kernel and this, is, and this is on the kernel because this is closed. Hmm? Therefore, we can take now the difference G naught minus P M of G naught and we can divide it by the norm. And let me denote it, this, this, this object here as F naught. This is well defined because the, the denominator is non-zero. Okay? And this is in the unit ball, of course. So what I'm doing is the following. 
I take this difference and I normalize it. So now, uh, if I imagine that this is the origin for the moment, then I have my unit ball. Okay, so let me. So this is too large. So this is. Let, let me denote it just by x. Huh? Okay, this is also uh, x. And this is also x. Then I have my unit ball. And therefore, what I'm consi so this is F naught, just F naught. Hmm? So I'm, I'm assuming that this is just uh, the origin for simplicity. Okay. So that is F naught. Now the claim is that H naught, we are looking for H naught. I have, unfortunately, I've erased the, the blackboard, but we look, so given L, um, so given L, we have an M, this is M, the kernel, right? We are looking for some H naught, and we will take at the end H naught parallel to this F naught, as we, I, I was trying to explain at the beginning, 10 minutes ago. Okay? So now let me try to show you. So at the end, H naught, look, we look for H naught parallel to F naught. So for the moment, we, we have never, we have not used, so we have maybe understood which is the direction of uh, um, of H naught, but still we don't know how long it must be, the norm of it. Because for the moment we have just used on on capital L, we have just used the information on the kernel, but capital L is not identified only by the kernel; it's identified by a kernel and something outside, right? So, so for the moment we have just uh, understood that maybe this is the direction where I have to find H naught. Now I have to find how long is this vector. And now I have to use the, the wall information on capital L that, that I have, not only its kernel. Okay? Uh, So, um, well, if not is one, this is written here because this is a unit ball. Now, uh, and therefore, uh, okay, well, it is clear that the, the following are, are obvious. I mean, F, F not is non zero, obvious. Uh, L F not, F not does not belong to M because LF naught is non-zero. Huh? So LF naught is non-zero. Huh? So this point is outside this. So LF naught is non-zero. And then what else? Uh, well, and F naught is, oh, so let me say, is orthogonal to M. So we know that F naught let me introduce, okay, F naught against M is equal to zero. This is the, these are the properties that we know on F naught, okay? This is uh, because remember F naught is a projection. 
is along, I mean, is, uh, is uh, G naught minus is its projection. So therefore, it is orthogonal to, to M. OK, so now take any H. And consider the following quantity, h minus, now lambda I have to find it. Let us consider the following quantity, h minus lambda f naught. And I want this to be in, the, in, in m. So if I want this to be in m, then this must be equal to 0. And therefore, lambda lambda. Now, so I, I can take lambda as equal to uh, L of H divided by L of F naught. I can do this because L of L of F naught is non zero. So this I can do. So summarizing, given any H, define this quantity with lambda equal to this. Okay. Hmm. So we, if 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 we define if we define lambda equal to this, then this is equal to zero. Therefore, uh, h minus l of h divided by l of f naught belongs to m. Hmm. Right? So, given any h, I just, uh, if there is some, something missing here, sorry. Sorry. So, uh, given any h, uh, I subtract, I subtract from h his normal part. I would say, so I subtract from H its normal, its orthogonal part to M, uh, because this is orthogonal, so this is orthogonal to M. I subtract its projection on the orthogonal line, so what remains is tangent, I mean is, is, in, the, is in the kernel. And therefore, once we know that is in the kernel, we know that this must be orthogonal, this is an element M. So must be orthogonal to F naught. Huh? And so we write down now this. this. So, so the idea is now we have identified a direction, say. Take any H. Take the tangential component of H along this. I mean, subtract to H its normal component. Huh? So it remains a point in this capital M. And therefore, it is orthogonal to F naught. OK, so what does it mean? It means that scalar product, so given any h, any h in h, the scalar product of this object with F naught must be 0. Hmm? That is uh, h minus L of H over L of F naught times F naught comma F naught. This must be equal to zero. Hmm? Is it okay up to now? Huh? Is it clear? It's OK. Clear? And hence, uh, I think that we are done, more or less, because we have that now, uh, so uh, h comma f naught must be equal to, uh, so by the way, F naught has norm 1. So 
L of H divided by L of R naught. Do you, do you agree? Because we are using that we have this normalization. Okay. And now we are done because you see we have uh, understood who is H naught. H naught is just a multiple of F naught. Because it follows that L of H equal to H H naught where H naught is by definition Do you agree? So the idea is, is completely geometric. Apart from the fact that we have to find this quantity here, which is due to the fact that we cannot know all the linear map knowing only the kernel. But at least if we know the kernel, we understand which is the direction of H of H naught. And this is, it is this. So this is orthogonal to this, in some sense. And this is the identification Metric. This is metric because if I change the um, the unit ball, I change a, a, a H naught. You see, also in finite dimension. If if I want to do this 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 in finite dimension, even in R two, if I change my scalar product, I mean I rotate a little bit the ellipse, then there is another H naught. So apart from the factors, the scaling factor L of F naught, I am identifying this vector, one codimensional vector space, comma, a value of L outside, uh, with this direction with the proper length. Okay, so this is the duality map between uh, the dual and H. Huh? This is the, the it's never easy, it's never easy to really manage with these duality mappings, huh? even in finite dimension. <coughs> So check that uh, the norm, so check by a term that L of H, this is, that the norm of this, uh, uh, we know, so uh, the norm of H naught is L of F naught. Uh, and check that this is also equal to normal value. Mm. Now, uniqueness. This gives us existence. So uniqueness of H naught, well, by construction, in some sense. So, but, but assume that there is another one, so H naught prime. Assume that we have two of them making the, so we know that L of H is equal to H H naught, but also H H naught prime for any H in H. Hmm? So this means that H H naught minus H naught prime is equal to zero for any H. Therefore, it is enough to test this with H equal to this difference. This is true for any H, right? Okay. So if I take inside this, I take H equal exactly this difference, I find that the norm of this difference must be equal to zero. Huh? A 
and therefore I find that uh, H is equal to H naught. Sorry, H naught minus sorry, H naught, H naught. Sorry, this H naught minus H naught prime. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I think that for today is, is enough. Finally, so <clears throat> from the next time, we will start with Banach spaces. I think that now you have sufficient experience on infinite dimensional vector spaces with, a, with an inner product. Therefore, and, and this is a deep theorem, by the way, even if the proof is not difficult. It is just, just a consequence of the projection theorem. Once you know how to project on a co closed convex set, then you have automatically this theorem. So Ritz, I mean, if you want to, to look from the outside now, you see that Ritz is just a consequence of the projection on convex set. So really the projection is something important. Uh, but this has a lot of consequences also from the conceptual point of view, which are never easy to, to focus. In any case, <clears throat> we have the experience of some infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. So from, from, from starting from tomorrow, Banach, we go quickly to Banach. And uh, maybe we will skip some proof that you will find in the Brezis book because, I mean, we have not so much time at our disposal and I would like to come also to Fourier analysis. And, uh, so maybe I will not prove everything that I will say tomorrow. Okay.